about your ability schedule. I really appreciate that. So I'm glad that we're going to resume our research seminar series starting today. And we have, today we have a special guest uh, from EOO Scrum Law, uh, Professor Opo Rahman. And he's going to talk about the war on terror and the freedom of the press in the Trump era which I think is very tiny, uh, so valuable topic <laughs> for us. So please join me in welcoming Professor Ofo Raban. Thank you. Um, all right. Do we need to test this? Does this You're work? You're good. Yep. Okay. Um, so like every major American war, the war on terror also brought about uh, pressures on constitutional rights and liberties. And of course, the most famous of those are outright violations of constitutional rights insofar as we're talking about the, uh, the use of torture or the indefinite detention of, uh, of uh, prisoners without any uh, judicial process. But this presentation is about the pressures that came to bear on the First Amendment's freedom of speech and press. And since 9-11, there were some substantial pressures that came to bear on these constitutional freedoms. And in fact, they came from all three branches of the, uh, of the federal government. So they included increased enforcement of existing laws, new legislation targeting various terror-related speech, and uh, apparent judicial reluctance to vigorously enforce existing constitutional uh, protections. One of the more disturbing developments of recent years, and this is something that in fact took place for the most part under the Obama administration, is the, uh, the willingness, the newfound willingness of the executive to prosecute leakers of classified information to the press. And uh, again, you probably uh, all heard the, the refrain that the Obama administration prosecuted more leakers of classified information than all previous administration uh, combined. And, uh, and, and so again, this is a development that certainly took place under President Obama. In fact, it had its seeds planted during the Bush administration because the task force that ultimately brought all these uh, prosecutions was in fact established under the Bush administration. But in fact, it was indeed under the uh, Obama presidency that uh, most of these prosecutions uh, took place. Now, all these prosecutions involved uh, charges under the Espionage Act. The Espionage Act is a draconian, vaguely worded statute that we will look at uh, in a few minutes that was originally enacted in 1917 that imposes heavy criminal penalties for the disclosure of classified information. Almost all the prosecuted individuals leaked information about government incompetence, government waste, and governmental abuses of power. Most of these, uh, most of the prosecuted individuals ended up serving substantial prison times, and a number of these prosecutions also ensnared the journalists who were involved in these uh, leaks. Let's go over some of the, uh, of the prosecutions, some examples of the prosecutions that uh, were uh, involved. In 2012, the government filed charges against John Kiriako. Kiriako is a former CIA officer who leaked uh, that terrorism suspects were tortured by CIA interrogators. Like many of the prosecutions that, were, that we are going to discuss, the original charges here were extremely heavy. The charges uh, could land Kiriako up to 45 years in federal prison. Now, ultimately, that was uh, reduced in a plea agreement, and uh, Kiriako ended up serving two and a half years in, in federal prison. But again, the initial charges in practically all these prosecutions involved uh, uh, charges carrying very long penalties. Another leaker is Jeffrey Sterling. Sterling is another former CIA officer, and he was sentenced in 2015 to three and a half years in prison for leaking information about an alleged uh, incompetence at the CIA involving an operation in Iran. Now, Sterling's information was leaked to New York Times reporter James Risen. And Risen was subpoenaed to testify at Sterling's criminal trial. Risen refused to testify 
he fought the subpoena. He went to the federal court and claimed that uh, uh, forcing him to disclose his confidential source is going to be in violation of the, uh, of the First Amendment. And he won at the federal, federal district court level. So the trial court, the federal trial court agreed with him and the judge held that in order to force uh, James Risen to disclose his confidential source for the story, the government had to show that it had a compelling interest in the journalist's testimony and it, had sh it also had to show that there were no other means of gaining the information. And the judge also held that the, uh, that the government simply failed to provide these, uh, these proofs and so it quashed the subpoena. This is the, uh, the term of art. It dismissed the subpoena. This, uh, the case was, uh, was appealed to the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals and the Fourth Circuit reversed the district court decision and held that in fact uh, James Risen could be forced to disclose his confidential source or may face uh, criminal charges himself if he doesn't. Now, the Fourth Circuit relied on a confusing and controversial Supreme Court decision that I'm sure uh, most of you know, that is the 1972 Brandsburg versus Hayes. Brandsburg versus Hayes is a decision that involved uh, journalists who were subpoenaed to appear in, uh, in grand jury investigations, to appear before grand, grand uh, jurors. And they were asked to disclose their confidential sources. This was a consolidation of three cases, in fact, as a Brandsburg decision. It involved a journalist who witnessed the uh, unlawful preparation of uh, hashish, of drugs, and also involved uh, one journalist who covered the Black Panthers when they were planning some form of, uh, of un uh, an unlawful activity. And so they were summoned before a grand jury and they, uh, they refused to, to disclose their sources. They were, fine. They were found guilty of, uh, of uh, contempt, contempt of court. They appealed the decision and ended up at the United States Supreme Court. Now note that the journalists made a very modest claim. They did not ask for an absolute privilege. They didn't say the government simply cannot force us to disclose our sources. Rather, it said the claim was, was much more modest. And this is how the Supreme Court described the claim. The newsmen in these cases assert that the reporter should not be forced to testify until and unless sufficient grounds are shown for believing that the information the reporter has is unavailable from other sources and that the need for the information is sufficiently compelling. By the way, this is precisely the, the ruling of the district court that I just described. But in fact, in 1972, the United States Supreme Court rejected the claim. The court says there is no such so-called journalistic privilege. And in fact, the government does not need to sh make such showings, does not need to jump through these hoops before it can force journalists to uh, disclose their confidential source. Uh, however, in that case, there was another concurring opinion filed by Justice Powell. Uh, this was a 5-4 decision, so Justice Powell's uh, uh, vote was crucial. Justice Powell voted the majority, uh, joined the majority opinion, but also penned his own concurring opinion. That was very confusing because Justice Powell's position seemed to side more with the dissenters and the journalists in the case rather than with the majority. So this is what Justice Powell wrote. He wrote, if the newsman has some reason to believe that his testimony implicates confidential source relationships without the legitimate need of law enforcement, he will have access to the court on a motion to quash and an appropriate protective order may be entered. The asserted claim to privilege should be judged on its facts by the striking of a proper balance between freedom of the press and the obligation to give relevant testimony with respect to criminal conduct on a case-by-case -case basis. Now again, this is an opinion that many people saw as uh, in conflict with the majority opinion that Justice Powell also joined because it recognizes implicitly some form of a journalistic privilege. And what happened in the subsequent decades was that lower courts, uh, in part because they found the majority position not very convincing, in fact followed Justice Powell's concurring opinion, in fact, instead of the majority opinion. This is, of course, uh, improper institutionally speaking, but, uh, but this is what happens when uh, the Supreme Court issues an opinion that is not very convincing. Judges find ways to go around that opinion, if you will, to distinguish it is the term of art that is used, the legal jargon is they distinguish it on, uh, on rather flimsy grounds. And this is, what, uh, this is how one federal judge described 
what happens to the Brandsburg opinion after it was decided. Given Brandsburg's internal confusion and the obvious First Amendment problems involved in compelling a reporter to disclose the identity of a confidential source, it is hardly surprising that lower courts have chipped away at the holding of Brandsburg, finding constitutional protections for reporters in various factual scenarios different than those presented in Brandsburg. Now, all this came to an end after 9-11. So after 9-11, courts again began enforcing the majority opinion in Brandsburg. And, uh, and in fact, this is precisely what happened to, uh, to James Risen. Risen went to the, as we said, Risen won, won at the district court level, but the Fourth Circuit reversed that decision and said, no, 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 Brandsburg's majority opinion governs, and that means that the government does not need to, have to, to show anything special before it can force uh, uh, Risen to disclose his confidential source. Risen then appealed to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court denied certiorari. And then he declared that, in fact, he's going to refuse to testify and would rather go to prison than testify. And the, uh, the Department of Justice uh, backs down eventually and, the, and, and uh, backs down from the, the, withdraws the subpoena and does not seek uh, Risen's testimony. But again, the ability of the government to force reporters to disclose confidential sources has been firmly uh, reestablished. Uh, and again, this is a development that follows uh, 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 the war on terror. In the same year that charges were filed against uh, Jeffrey Sterling, charges were also brought against Stephen Kim, State Department analyst and a North Korean expert that gave classified information to Fox News reporter James Rosen. So this is not Ryzen, this is Rosen, working for Fox News. Uh, he was given information by, uh, by Mr. Kim regarding uh, North Korea. Um, Kim ultimately pleaded guilty to a single felony count and was sentenced to uh, 13 months in uh, prison. But it was later discovered that the Department of Justice uh, secretly seized the journalist Rosen's phone records and emails during that investigation. And he did so, in fact, uh, by claiming that Rosen was an aider and a better and a co-conspirator in Espionage Act violations. So the position that the Department of Justice took in those cases was that a journalist was himself allegedly guilty of serious federal felonies that could land him for decades in prison for receiving classified information from a, from a government leaker. Now, when that came out, there was a mini scandal that was directed at the Department of Justice, and uh, the Department of Justice uh, uh, ultimately claimed that uh, it's going to revise its guidelines. Eric Holder uh, said that there would be no such prosecutions. Uh, but in fact, when you look at the Espionage Act itself, the Espionage Act directly allows the government to go after journalists who receive and public class publish classified information. They didn't even have to claim that. Rosen was a co-conspirator of the leaker. They could just go directly after him and after Fox News uh, for violations of the Espionage Act. Let me show you two provisions. There are other that are relevant. Let me show you two provisions of this, uh, as I said, this draconian federal statute originally enacted in 1917 uh, during the First World War and uh, amended several times since. Gathering, transmitting, or losing defense information the Espionage Act reads, whoever with intent or reason to believe that the information is to be used to the injury of the United States obtains any document connected with the national defense shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years or both. Of course, many of these prosecutions involve several charges uh, re related to several documents, for instance. So you can have decades upon decades of, uh, of possible prison times if you pile up those charges. Here is another Espionage Act uh, provision, section 798, whoever knowingly and willfully publishes any classified information concerning the communication intelligence activities of the United States, again, shall be fined under this title or imprisoned not more than 10 years. Uh, now, I should immediately say that uh, the constitutionality of such a prosecution of journalists or their employers is highly controversial, right? This is a highly suspect uh, 
this may be a highly suspect uh, uh, case. But in fact, it was tried before. So this is not merely a theoretical, uh, a theoretical discussion. In 1942, the Roosevelt administration brought espionage uh, uh, act charges against the Chicago Tribune for publishing national security information. In that particular case, the grand jury refused to, uh, to indict the Chicago Tribune. But there were, since various times, where there were threats of Espionage Act violations. So the Nixon administration threatened the New York Times and the Washington Post for Espionage Act prosecutions when they published the Pentagon Papers. Uh, more recently, Alberto Gonzalez, who was Attorney General under President George W. Bush, claimed that the disclosure of the NSA's secret surveillance program and the CIA's secret prisons were in violation of the Espionage Act. Though again, they did not actually file such charges. And this November, it was reported that the Trump administration was considering Espionage Act charges against uh, Julian Assange of WikiLeaks. Now again, this is also not completely new information. In fact, there are rumors of some sealed in indictment against Assange that has been circulated for a long time now. <coughs> but again, uh, there is a threat of such espionage acts against uh, WikiLeaks and its founder. One potential difficulty with such a prosecution was that, of course, uh, newspapers like the New York Times publish much of the same information that was published by WikiLeaks. So the ramifications of such a prosecution, of course, uh, is going to be, are going to be heard among uh, the established media just as well, and this is perhaps maybe one reason why we did not yet see a prosecution of, uh, of WikiLeaks or of Assange. Um, let me talk about Bradley, now Chelsea Manning. Um, Chelsea Manning was convicted of leaking hundreds of thousands of documents to WikiLeaks. Again, this is part of the basis for the potential uh, Espionage Act indictment against uh, WikiLeaks. In 2013, a military judge found that Manning committed uh, various offenses, including several violations of the Espionage Act, and sentenced her to 35 years of imprisonment. Uh, as we know, President Obama commuted the sentence, and uh, Manning ended up serving uh, only seven years of this 35-year sentence. Now, one of the charges that were brought against Manning was aiding the enemy. Aiding the enemy is a provision of the uh, military code that is punishable by death. And the charge claimed that Manning aided the enemy indirectly. He did so by providing information to WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks then posted the information online. That information was accessed by enemies of the United States. And this is how Manning is guilty of aiding the enemy. His lawyer said, no, 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 in order to find Manning guilty of aiding the enemy, the prosecution must prove that, in fact, Manning intended to help the enemy. But the judge in the trial, in this military trial, in fact, rejected the claim. She said, it is enough if Manning knew that the information is going to be accessed by enemies of the United States. There is no requirement that he actually intend to help enemies of the United States, if he released the, the information to WikiLeaks uh, and he knew that WikiLeaks is going to post it online and that enemies of the United States will in fact access it, that is enough to get this capital punishment uh, conviction. By the way, the judge, uh, there was an exchange during the trial where the judge asked the prosecutors whether it would be different if the information was released to the, uh, were released to the New York Times. And the prosecution said, no, it would make no difference and the judge nevertheless agreed then with the prosecution. So it wouldn't have made a difference if the information would have been released to the New York Times. The, uh, the, the, the helping, aiding the enemy charge uh, was nevertheless, was still upheld. Now, at the end of the day, Manning was not found guilty of aiding the enemy. It's not quite clear why. Uh, but again, like the Espionage Act itself, we see here a blurring of the line between leakers and spies. Finally, I should mention the, uh, the fact that the Department of Justice seized two months' worth of records of 20 Associated Press telephone lines while it was investigating a leak uh, regarding a CIA operation in Yemen. 
the exact number of journalists that were exposed to this government surveillance is about 100. Many of them are working on various, uh, various articles about the government. Um, last June, the Trump administration announced its first prosecution of a leaker to the press. Realty Lee Winner, she is the 25-year-old uh, uh, intelligence contractor who was charged with violations of the Espionage Act, again, heavy penalties, for sending a classified report to the news media concerning Russia's interference in the 2016 elections. And in August, that is two months after uh, uh, Ms. Winner was, uh, was arrested and charged, Attorney General Jeff Session announced that leak investigations have tripled under the Trump administration. Uh, so there are lots of uh, investigations going on about leaking information to the press that are in the pipelines uh, of the Department of Justice. Now, the impact of this spike in prosecutions against leakers of government information has been profound. And here is a quotation from a book published by a New York Times reporter, uh, Charlie Savage, that described what happened as a result, what happened to investigative journalism as a result of these prosecutions. Overnight, the rules changed. People were going to prison. The crackdown sent fear throughout the national security establishment. Even discussing routine things on background to make sure reporters understood, understood them became much more difficult. Ordinary national security investigative journalism was placed into a deep chill. <coughs> Um, we should remember that some of the biggest scandals of the war on terror, in fact, became known only thanks to such uh, leaks of classified information. So uh, the CIA's use of torture, the CIA's use of black sites, and the secret surveillance program, for example, are th these are three examples of, leak of leaks of classified information that allow the public to know what is going on with the war on, on terror. Another thing worth remembering is that the government is, uh, is engaged in selective enforcement. So sometimes it goes after these leakers and charges them with, uh, with crimes that can land them in prison for decades. And sometimes it doesn't investigate at all or it does something very minor. For example, when it was discovered that retired General David Petraeus was leaking highly classified information to his intended biographer. That event was, uh, was, was closed with Patreos pleading guilty to a misdemeanor with no prison time. So there is obviously a, lots of selective enforcement going on in, gov in the government going after these, uh, these leakers, and such selective enforcement is, of course, a serious danger to the integrity of journalistic coverage. Now, I should also say that this, is, this spike in prosecution is not only the result of, uh, of the war on terror. There is no doubt that technology is playing a part in this spike in prosecutions. So uh, think, for instance, about Chelsea Manning releasing hundreds of thousands of uh, diplomatic cables and U.S. Army reports with a few clicks of the, of the keyboard. Or Edward Snowden. Who, uh, who manages to leak 1.7, according to some estimates, 1.7 million intelligence files. Now compare this to uh, Daniel Ellsberg in 1970, Xeroxing, one page at the time, the Pentagon Papers, right? This was a 7,000 uh, page document, and it took him weeks to photocopy the Pentagon Papers uh, for release. So what we have here, of course, is an exponentially greater danger to, uh, to American secrets. So no, no doubt one part of this uh, spike in prosecutions is the perception that, in fact, uh, with modern uh, cyber technology, there is here a much greater danger than existed in the past. Also, cyber technology may allow the government to, uh, to catch these leakers because now it has access to lots of electronic communications, uh, location, GPS locations, um, emails, cell phones, digital cameras that can basically store unlimited amount of information. All these tools may in fact enable the government to uh, track down and catch those leakers in ways that uh, perhaps it couldn't, uh, it couldn't do previously. Uh, so again, these are additional factors. There is no doubt that without the cover, the political cover of the war on terror, uh, 
we would not see all these uh, prosecutions. Uh, but these are certainly additional uh, reasons why we see this, uh, this spike in prosecution of leakers of information, of classified information to the, uh, to the press. Let's talk about the secret surveillance program. This is also an issue that, uh, that is of great interest to uh, journalists. Shortly after 9-11, the NSA embarked on an extensive and secret surveillance, surveillance of electronic communications. Now, I imagine that you are all familiar with the uh, New York Times story surrounding this disclosure. The New York Times learned of this, uh, of this program in 2004, sat on the story for a whole year, uh, in part because of misrepresentation on the part of the Bush administration, but this is, again, this is a, a mini scandal all its own, if you will. Ultimately, the newspaper published the, uh, the information after, uh, after it, was threat it was threatened, in fact, uh, the, the reporters, one of the reporters who, uh, who exposed the story, uh, threatened to um, publish it uh, in, a, in a book. In any event, this was also a publication, a disclosure that was brought about Espionage Act uh, prosecution threats from the Bush administration, threats that did not in fact materialize. But once the, the existence of the program was disclosed, various lawsuits were filed claiming that this was a violation of people's uh, First Amendment freedom of speech including journalists who claim that they find it hard to collect uh, newsworthy information because people are simply afraid to disclose information because practically everything is being uh, monitored by, uh, by, the, by the government. And uh, these lawsuits were brought in various courts, various federal courts uh, around the country. In 2006, a federal district court found that the program violated several constitutional provisions including the First Amendment's freedom of speech because it chilled expression. Again, people were chilled from, uh, from expressing themselves or from uh, cooperating with journalists because of fear that everything they say is being surveilled. But that decision was soon overturned by an appeals court on the basis that the plaintiffs lacked standing. Now, standing is a constitutional doctrine developed by the United States Supreme Court that requires that plaintiffs, before they can have their day in federal court, show that they suffered an actual injury. And the claim here was that the plaintiffs who complained about the, the unconstitutionality of the secret surveillance program could not, in fact, prove that they were subjected to surveillance. Well, of course, they could not prove because this was a secret surveillance program, but, uh, but that was the basis for reversing this uh, district court decision. And in fact, in 2013, in a case titled ACLU versus Clapper, the United States Supreme Court dismissed a similar lawsuit. Against this was a lawsuit uh, that was filed on behalf of journalists who claim that they, are, uh, they cannot uh, perform their jobs because of the secret surveillance program. And the United States Supreme Court again said, um, the plaintiffs cannot prove that they are in fact subjected to surveillance. Now, of course, whether these journalists were subjected to surveillance was something that the government knew. But the government declined to disclose the information. It said to the courts, this is a secret program. We are not going to tell you whether these journalists are in fact being surveilled or not. And the court, instead of saying, well, if you're not going to tell us, we're going to hold this against you, the court in fact said, ah, well, you're not going to tell us, so they cannot prove that they are being surveilled, so they have no standing. And, uh, and the court ended up uh, disclosing the, uh, uh, dismissing the case, I'm sorry. Uh, this was a 5-4 a, a decision, so another one in this series of very controversial decisions that were made by the court. In fact, the dissenters in the case said, uh, we only need to assume that the government is doing its job uh, in order to assume that these people are being surveilled. The majority refused to accept that and dismissed the, uh, dismissed the lawsuit. Now, a few months, only a few months after the decision was made, Edward Snowden released... Uh, lots of information that made it uh, very probable that these journalists were in fact being surveilled because it made it uh, very probable that we are all being surveilled. <laughs> Snowden in fact showed the huge extent of the secret surveillance program and, uh, and following this disclosure, a number of courts in fact found that uh, there is standing for people who try to challenge the constitutionality of the secret surveillance program although we did not see the, uh, the kind of uh, more sweeping decisions 
that we saw before the, uh, the Supreme Court decision in 2013 that simply invalidated the secret surveillance program. The issue is not likely to die because uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, Congress, in fact, uh, extended the secret surveillance program and, in fact, extended it in a way that uh, did not uh, provide many of the protections that privacy advocates ask for. So uh, there's still lots of litigation going on around the secret surveillance program and uh, lots of litigation uh, is likely to be seen in the future. One of the most controversial questions regarding the freedom of speech and the war on terror concerned the dissemination of terrorist propaganda, especially on the internet, that is used for recruitment of, uh, of terrorists. Now, many countries dealt with this issue heads on. Here is, for instance, the, uh, the English Terrorism Act, which was uh, a response to the th 2005 uh, London bombing. And this act reads, or rather the Terrorism Act makes it a crime to recklessly or intentionally publish a statement that is likely to be understood as encouragement or other inducement to the commission preparation or instigation of acts of terrorism, including statements glorifying the commission or preparation of such acts. So this is one way to deal with uh, jihadist propaganda, if you will. Uh, but this is not constitutional in the United States. The United States Supreme Court made a decision in 1969 that uh, held the following. The constitutional guarantees of free speech and free, free press do not permit the government to forbid or prescribe advocacy of the use of force or of law violation, except where such advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. So if you cannot show that this uh, speech is likely to produce imminent lawless action, that is constitutionally protected speech. Now again, this decision was made against the background of the Vietnam War protests and the civil rights movement, where judges wanted to protect calls for unlawful action on the part of people who were uh, protesting a very bloody, costly, and useless war, and people who claim who wanted to, uh, to advance racial equality. And oftentimes they did so, of course, through calls for unlawful action. Uh, various sit-ins or uh, burning draft cards or what have you. But in fact, what this decision means is that uh, the outright prohibition of jihadist propaganda <coughs> is in fact un unconstitutional under American constitutional law. Now, the war on terror brought about lots of calls for uh, revision or overruling of the Brandenburg decision. So in fact, these are calls that came uh, from highly respectable uh, scholars as well who claimed that, uh, that the Supreme Court should, should simply revise Brandenburg uh, in order to allow the outright criminalization of uh, jihadist propaganda, especially on the internet. But these calls, in fact, uh, are not likely in the near future. That is to say, it's not likely in the near future that the, that the courts or the Supreme Court would overrule Brandenburg. In fact, Brandenburg has a long history where people were essentially uh, sent to long prison sentences in the United States for political activism. And so many people are understandably reluctant to, uh, to allow for the uh, weakening or the overruling of the uh, Brandenburg standard. So Brandenburg does not, at the moment, does not stand a, a risk of being overruled. But in fact, Brandenburg is being weakened by other means. So there are signs, in fact, that Brandenburg is giving way in some indirect uh, ways. Let me show you one example of uh, Brandenburg given way. And this is, uh, this is a statute that was enacted, uh, or rather was amended in 2004. So again, this is part of the, uh, the post-9-11 uh, world that we have. And it is a statute, the, a federal statute, that makes it a federal crime to knowingly provide material support to a terrorist organization. And according to the statutory definitions, material support can come in the form of speech, such as giving various form of advice or what have you. And conviction could be obtained without compliance with the Brandenburg standard. So that in order to convict somebody under this law, the government does not have to show that in fact the speech was likely to produce imminent violence. 
Now, uh, the decision was, uh, was challenged as a violation of the First Amendment, in part because the Brandenburg standard is not complied with by this statute. But the Supreme Court rejected the challenge. The Supreme Court upheld the law, and it said the following. It said, we interpret the statute to mean that any independent advocacy is not prohibited. What is prohibited is only advocacy performed in coordination with or at the direction of a foreign terrorist organization. So they say, this is not a statute that allows the government to go after people for mere speech, for calling, say, for jihadist attacks. It allows the government to punish such speech only if that speech is done in coordination with a foreign terrorist organization. Now, in response to that, Justice Breyer wrote in dissent, <coughs> sorry, he wrote, I am not aware of any form of words that might be, might be used to describe coordination that would not, at a minimum, seriously chill the independent advocacy the government purports to permit. In other words, the dissent says, you know, this requirement of coordination with a foreign terrorist organization doesn't sound like it would be protective enough of the freedom of speech. And a case from 2012 put that theory to the test. So this is a case from Massachusetts where a jury convicted a man named Tarek Mahana of providing material support to Al-Qaeda, among other things, based on the... Uh, on, the, on, on his acts of translating Islamist materials into English and posting them on the internet. So again, he translates these uh, Islamist materials, uh, uh, pro-terrorism uh, materials, and then posts them on the internet. He ended up uh, being sentenced to 17 years of imprisonment for that. He appeals his conviction, uh, uh, but the appeals court reject his appeal. They claimed that there was sufficient evidence of coordination between Tarek Mehana and uh, Al-Qaeda. Now, the evidence that was presented at the trial showed that the internet site where Mehana posted his materials was also used for recruitment by Al-Qaeda. And it also showed that there were very few inconclusive emails, completely unclear and vague and that went nowhere between Mehana and the operator of the site. And the opera of the site was himself later convicted of, of uh, providing material support to terrorism. This was the only evidence that the government presented in order to show coordination with Al-Qaeda. Now, the lawyers for, uh, for Mr. Mehana said uh, in order to find Mehana guilty of material support for terrorism, there must be shown some kind of a direct relationship, direct coordination with the uh, terrorist organization, but the, uh, the courts rejected that claim. They said any indirect form of coordination would do, and in fact the evidence that was presented here is sufficient to provide such coordination, such that uh, Mehana can be found guilty of, uh, of this offense. Note again that the government did not have to prove that Mehana had any intent of uh, supporting terrorist uh, activities. Uh, it was enough that he had the knowledge that what he was doing may in fact aid this, these terrorist organizations. Um, now, I personally do not shed tears for this uh, 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 jihadist sympathizer. In fact, uh, Mahana traveled to Yemen looking for a terrorist training camp and returned after he couldn't find one. So this is, not a, this is no, no, no angel by any means. But again, it shows to what extent uh, the government can get close in, uh, in criminalizing uh, and heavily criminalizing uh, uh, pro-terrorist speech, if you will. And to that extent, it is important to think about the very definition of the, of the term terrorism. What is terrorism? And in fact, Congress provided provide us with uh, one interesting example of what terrorism is. This is a federal statute titled Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. And it is a makes it a federal crime to intentionally damage or cause the loss of any real or personal property, including animals or records used by an animal enterprise. This is a federal statute. 
that came to uh, combat uh, animal rights activists. And uh, it came to combat them by describing what they, uh, what they do as a form of uh, terrorism. So when we think about uh, uh, the ability of the federal government to go after uh, terrorism, remember that the term terrorism itself may be quite flexible. All right, let me sum up. Uh, since 9-11, we have seen an unprecedented number of prosecutions of leakers of information to the press. We have seen investigations and surveillance of journalists. We have seen judicial decisions placing procedural hurdles in the ability of people to vindicate their First Amendment rights. And we also saw apparent judicial reluctance to rigorously enforce existing constitutional uh, protections at least in the context of the, uh, of, of the war on terror and fighting terrorism. I think one important lesson from all this is that, in fact, um, we can suffer substantial curtailments of our constitutional liberties without any substantial change in constitutional doctrine. So the fact that we did not see any real substantial revision in First Amendment doctrine uh, does not mean that the government cannot, in fact, seriously uh, limit the First Amendment freedoms that we, in fact, uh, enjoy uh, uh, or used to enjoy before 9-11. And this lesson is, of course, especially relevant for us today. Uh, first, to remind you, the war on terror is a war uh, without end. And we have in the White House a president that has promised to aggressively pursue the war on terror. Now, this is also a president who seems particularly dismissive of uh, free speech and specifically in regard to constitutional protections to free speech. So, uh, President Trump called the news media enemy of the American people, stated that it should be easier to sue the media for libel. This is, of course, something that is uh, regulated by the uh, First Amendment. Stated that those who burn the American flag should be jailed and stripped of their citizenship. This is, again, a statement that is in contradiction of the First Amendment. He called for radical restrictions of speech on the internet, again, in violation of standing constitutional doctrine. His lawyers issued threatening and constitutionally dubious cease and desist letters to the author of an unflattering author and publisher of a recent unflattering book about him. He also ruminated about taking away NBC's news broadcasting license. And even though NBC does not have broadcasting license, that is still uh, quite worrisome. And more recently, uh, Trump began attacking Amazon and its founder, Jeff Bezos, many people believe because of the harsh criticism he suffers uh, over the pages, on the pages of the Washington Post, which Bezos owns. So this alarming attitude towards the freedom of speech, combined with a perpetual war on terror, and the potential for under-the-radar restrictions of constitutional rights and liberties, all these make for a dangerous cocktail. Thank you. So, thank you, Professor Ravan, for this very informative and intriguing talk. I uh, learned personally learned a great deal out of this talk. So, now uh, Q and A time. So, we have about a little over ten minutes. So, feel free to ask, uh, Brandon. Uh, <coughs> so, it sounds. Assuming that Julian Assange and Edward Snowden both came back to the United States to be tried, do you think that they would be tried, that, their, that the outcomes of that case would be different because of the attempts that Snowden made to, I mean, I know that he leaked information, but there's a difference between Julian Assange data mining and just dumping it directly to the web and, and Edward Snowden making appointments with journalists and giving that material to them and saying, I'm, give, I'm letting you decide what is newsworthy. Do you think that would be hand, that nuance would be handled differently in the court of law, or would they all just be guilty of the Espionage Act? First, I think there is a more important distinction between the two. Edward Snowden is a leaker. Edward Snowden is somebody who signed uh, confidentiality forms and no doubt violated his duties to keep information that came his way secret. Julian Assange is, in a way, a publisher. So this is the important distinction, if you will, between Snowden and Assange, and why a prosecution of Snowden is, insofar as the First Amendment is concerned, much less problematic than a, than a prosecution of, uh, of Assange. Right? So uh, 
That is the, that is the more significant uh, distinction between them. Um, the question in the case of, Ass of Assange is whether the fact that there was indeed no real editorial uh, uh, sifting work done in regards to the materials, whether that should make any distinction. Uh, under First Amendment doctrine, in fact, it should not. And the reason is that, in fact, journalists do not enjoy any First Amendment, special First Amendment protections. So although the, uh, the First Amendment specifically mentions the press, the Supreme Court has long held that the press is entitled to the same protections that the general public does and vice versa. So, uh, so there is much to speak about insofar as we talk about the, uh, the, whether, whether, Assange talk, whether Assange acted as a real journalist would or not is in principle irrelevant to the First Amendment issue uh, that, that, is concern, that we're concerned with here. It is, of course, it may be important for the decision whether to prosecute or not. Right? So insofar as you have uh, uh, the New York Times that in fact uh, uh, takes care not to publish information that may be harmful, etc., that may, of course, uh, limit the, uh, the willingness of the, uh, of the executive to go after the New York Times. But again, as I mentioned, the problem with going after Assange is that much of the information that Assange published was also published by uh, established media. Right? And uh, again, insofar as the First Amendment is concerned, that there would not be a distinction between Assange and the New York Times. So you ask whether there is a difference in terms of in terms of the First Amendment, yes. whether the publication came in the form of a newspaper article or tattoos. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I think that this is another way of publication, mm -hmm. and uh, and the First Amendment doesn't seem to draw these uh, these lines. Suppose suppose that you tattooed on your body an offer of. Uh, Fifty thousand dollars for anybody willing to murder your wife. I mean, you're not going to be pro that speech is not going to be protected, even though it is tattooed, right? Why would it be protected if it encourages uh, terrorism? It doesn't seem to make a difference how you publish the information in this regard. Yeah. <laughs> Please. Now, uh, what about the uh, role of the of foreign surveillance? I see, foreign intelligence surveillance code in the equation of this kind of war on terrorism. So does uh, the foreign intelligence surveillance code play a very important role in balancing freedom of expression since 1911? It, it is certainly playing an important role in issuing uh, 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 warrants. Uh, but again, it is the the the, it is a secret court. And this is another uh, anomaly that is uh, unique to this context of, uh, of terrorism and foreign intelligence in that we have a federal court with, uh, in fact, rotating uh, judges that uh, the constitution of the court is decided by the chief justice of the Supreme Court that make very important decisions uh, in regard to search warrants uh, without actually issuing opinions that, are, that we can publicly scrutinize and examine. Um, some of the documents that Snowden released, in fact, pertain to, uh, to decisions of the foreign court. Look, the statistics that we have, that we, at least the statistics that we had uh, until 2013 showed that practically all applications were granted. So the, for every thousand, thousands of thousands of requested applications, there were very few that were actually uh, 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 if any, that were denied or revised, right? So it seems like it was operating, up to that point at least, it was operating as a kind of uh, rubber stamp. But since the Snowden revelations, there have been a much greater scrutiny of their operations and their decisions, and in fact, they actually went ahead and released some opinions in order to bolster their credibility. Um, 
But still, this is, yeah, it is a very important court insofar as surveillance is concerned, but it is still a court that operates in secret, something that is quite an anomaly in, uh, under the rule of law. All right. Well, All right. thank you. Thank you very much yes, for inviting thank you. me. So uh, we don't have.